I want to take that as my text this morning from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 22, uh, verses 34 through 40. And if you're making, uh, if you have a Bible nearby, I want to encourage you to go ahead and grab it or a New Testament. Uh, Matthew, of course, is the first book, first gospel in the in the, in the New Testament. Uh, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 22, uh, verses 34 through 40. And I've I've titled my talk this morning, uh, "Love God." Love people. Love God. Love people. Indeed, I was uh, saying to someone just uh, the other day that uh, the Christian life isn't easy, uh, but it's simple. Uh, that is to say that it's not complicated. Indeed, it isn't any more complicated than love God and love people. And Matthew tells us in verse uh, 34 that uh, when the Pharisees had heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, uh, they gathered together. Pharisees, Sadducees. Uh, we might mention that there were three major religious groups in, in Jesus' day. The Sadducees were one of them. The Sadducees uh, were a priestly class based in Jerusalem. They were by and large uh, wealthy, uh, coming from uh, aristocratic families. In Jesus' day, they represented the most uh, powerful segment of the Sanhedrin in, in Jerusalem. Indeed, uh, the high priest Caiaphas uh, was himself a Sadducee. And then there was a group uh, not mentioned in the New Testament and yet uh, very much a part of what Jesus would have been aware of in his own day, a group called the Essenes. Uh, the Essenes were a separatist uh, group uh, that, uh, that felt that the synagogues uh, in Palestine and the temple in Jerusalem uh, were corrupt. And uh, so they pretty much just stayed to themselves. Uh, it was the uh, Essenes who were associated with the so-called Qumran uh, community out in the Judean wilderness south of Jerusalem. In fact, uh, this is the group that was responsible for what we know as the Dead Sea Scrolls. And then we have the Pharisees. I think probably the Pharisees are the ones that we're most uh, familiar with. It was certainly the Pharisees that Jesus had uh, the most interaction with and perhaps uh, the ones he criticized the most. Uh, but the Pharisees uh, were, uh, by and large, what we would call working class people. And yet, uh, not only working class, but uh, uh, very serious students of the Torah and the scriptures uh, and the traditions of the rabbis. Uh, and still, uh, they were in Jerusalem. Uh, they held seats uh, on the Sanhedrin, that is the Jewish council uh, that was centered uh, in Jerusalem. Truth be told, and this may not uh, be, come as a great surprise, inasmuch as the Sadducees came from aristocratic families uh, and the Pharisees were working class men, uh, the Pharisees and the Sadducees didn't like each other very much. Uh, and so uh, when, when, the, when the Pharisees heard that, sad, that, this, uh, that the Sadducees had failed uh, to silence Jesus, of course, trying, uh, 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 attempting to uh, discredit him uh, and get him to ca caught up in his, in, his, in his words, the Pharisees may very well have been uh, rather happy about that. And still the Pharisees uh, thought that perhaps they'd take another crack at Jesus and maybe try to do the same. And yet the question posed uh, seems a rather tame one. In fact, when one uh, com um, compares Matthew's account uh, of this event in Jesus's life uh, to the account that we find in the Gospel of Mark, uh, it, it doesn't seem really that the Pharisee that actually posed the question uh, meant much harm if he meant any harm at all. But Matthew says that to one of the Pharisees had gathered together, and then one of them, a, a lawyer that is an expert in the law of Moses and the and the tradition of the of the rabbis, asked Jesus a question to test him. Uh, and he asked this rather uh, tame question, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And then, and then notice uh, uh, again uh, in uh, verse uh, uh, 37 and 38. And, and then it says, and then Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God in answer to the Pharisee's question. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And then he adds a second. He says, and, and a second like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law 
and the prophets. And so Jesus says, quoting from Deuteronomy 6, uh, partially from uh, what was known amongst the Jews as the great Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one God. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, etc. And Jesus, quoting this, says, uh, love God. And, and how are we to love God? Well, Jesus says a few things, and the first of, uh, the first of which is, uh, love the Lord your God with all your heart. With all your heart, Jesus says. That is not half-hearted, as is sometimes the case, even amongst avid churchgoers, but, but rather genuinely and, and, and devotedly. Uh, he says, with all your heart. Uh, that is, uh, with a, f a, a full, heartfelt commitment, love God. Uh, that is, uh, sincerely and truly, uh, without divided loyalties, uh, in which God is uh, really God to you and to me. Uh, not with divided loyalties. Indeed, in this same Gospel of Matthew, in the sixth chapter, Jesus famously said that no one can serve two masters. And so there can be no divided loyalties. We're, uh, indeed, we're either committed to God or we're not. As we said, I think, a week or so ago, with Jesus, it's all or, or nothing. And so in this, there can be no uh, fence sitting or one foot in and one foot out. Indeed, what Jesus is talking about is a genuine, heartfelt commitment to God in which God is our first love and nothing else is allowed to take his place. And then Jesus says, and love God with all your mind. That, that is, uh, uh, with all your understanding, uh, with all your reasoning powers. And I, I think perhaps this is where the issue of conviction comes in. Indeed, conviction is a thing of the mind in which, in which uh, we love God as number one in our life, and we know why we, why we love him. Uh, as, as number one in our life. We're not doubtful or double-minded about it. God is our creator, our redeemer, and our sustainer. Or as uh, the Apostle Paul said in, in Acts chapter 17, it's in God that we live and move and have our being. And so it makes sense. I mean, in our mind, we are, we, we are fully devoted to, to God because it makes sense. And we are fully devoted, not because it's fashionable, or because we suppose it might uh, please some people, uh, but because we, we know in our mind that God is God and that he's worthy of our devotion. And then Jesus says, and, and love God with all your soul, which perhaps is just another way of, of saying, uh, love God with all your being, with all that you are and all that you have. Uh, that, that is a, a total surrender of yourself to God, holding nothing back. Think about how you, how you hold back, how we hold ourselves back. I'm going to commit a little bit. I'm going to give a little bit. I'm, gonna give, I'm, gonna, I'm going to surrender a little bit, but not everything. I'm going to control some of it. Uh, but, but with all your soul, Jesus says, holding nothing back which actually is what we're created for. Uh, we are the creature and God is the creator. We are creatures of the living God. And without this total surrender to the creator, uh, we can really never know full joy. When we're holding back, I, I love what uh, Hans Kug once said, when somebody asked him, the German theologian, Hans, why did you become a Christian? He said that I might be truly human that I might be a truly human, um, the, the creation that God always meant me to be, that the creation that God always designed me to be. God designed me and designed you to be totally surrendered to him, holding nothing back. As David Taylor, and I think I quoted David, who was a parishioner of ours and just up, up until a, a year or so ago in his great book that was published by Tyndall Press this, uh, just this last year, I think in the spring, uh, entitled Open and Unafraid, which I commend to you. It's worth every page. But he said to be full of God is to be full of joy. And so that's the first thing, to love God. And then Jesus says, and love people. 
Uh, notice again uh, verses 37 through 40. And Jesus said to the Pharisee who had asked him, which is the, the greatest uh, commandment in, in the law? Jesus said, I, uh, to, to, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. And so Jesus says, and love your neighbors yourself. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And love your neighbors yourself. Well, how, would, how are we to understand that? I think maybe an easy way to go about it is to to refer to the to what we it's not in the Bible, but we often uh, or this this title is not uh, uh, in the Bible, but we often refer to it as as the golden rule uh, from this same gospel, Matthew's gospel, chapter seven and verse twelve, uh, in which Jesus said, "So whatever you wish others would do to you, do also to them." For this is the law and the prophets. And there's that phrase again. Jesus says, whatever you would wish others to do to you, <laughs> do also to them. Well, what would you have other people do to you? Well, I, I know I, how I, I know how I want to I, how I want to be treated by other people. Uh, I, I want to tre be treated justly by people. That is to say, I want to be treated fairly by other people. Uh, for sure, I know I don't want to be treated unfairly. I, I, don't, I don't want to be uh, cheated by anybody. I, I don't want to be the victim of gossip or slander. I don't want to be the, the victim of unkept promises or other things that we might list. And, and Jesus says, okay, good. And he says, and so do that to, to other people. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Uh, if you want to be treated fairly, treat them fairly. Uh, it, 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 and that even if it costs you something. In fact, that's one of the one of the uh, points that's made in the in the in the Psalms. Uh, the, the righteous man is, is the one who keeps his word even to his own hurt. <laughs> he keeps his word. He acts justly. Uh, if you owe if you owe people money, pay them. <laughs> uh, you'd want them to pay you. Uh, if you owe uh, people a service, serve them. And according to Jesus, this is what it means to love your neighbor as yourself. And so I want to be uh, treated fairly. You want to be treated fairly. And so Jesus says, treat other people fairly. A and then, you know, I, I, want to, I want people to treat me even better than fairly sometimes, especially when I need it. I, I, want, I want people to, be, to treat me graciously. Uh, and, and in fact, I, I need grace when I fail. Uh, just as you need grace when you fail. Uh, I need forgiveness sometimes, uh, more often than I care to admit. Uh, I, I need that, that forgiveness, uh, an opportunity to start afresh. And, and so Jesus says, all right, good. Uh, and so treat other people that way. Uh, if you want to be treated graciously, then, then give grace to other people when they need it. Uh, and and when, they, when they need to be forgiven, forgive them when they need it, even if they don't have the spiritual maturity to ask for forgiveness. Go on and forgive them anyway. I mean, this is a primary New Testament principle. Just forgive them. You start it. Don't wait around for them to come and ask you for forgiveness. Forgive them in your heart. Do them a favor. And by the way, that's something that God will honor because, you know, that's just exactly the way God deals with us. He forgives us before we get round to asking God, asking him for forgiveness. In fact, the psalmist said, who can know how oft he offends? Which means that we offend God m more times than we're even aware of. And yet in his grace, uh, he forgives us. And so do them a favor. <laughs> Be spiritually mature. Be like God and forgive them whether they ask for it or not. Do yourself a favor, by the way. Uh, you, you know, holding a grudge uh, may uh, may feed our ego, uh, but it but it won't make us uh, any more joyful or peaceful. Uh, just 
Ask somebody who's holding a grudge. Says, or maybe you're, hold, maybe you're holding a grudge uh, against somebody or more than one person. How does that make you feel? Does it make you feel joyful? Make you feel free? In fact, the Greek word uh, for, uh, for forgiveness means release. And when we forgive other people, we not only release them, rather than holding them as debtors to us until they make it right or they come back groveling or come back and ask for forgiveness. To, to, to forgive them is to release them. And, and when we release them, we release ourselves because instead of holding it within us, we just let it go. And so that's what it means to love your neighbor as yourself. I always appreciated something that St. John of the Cross said. He said, all good things come to me now because I no longer seek them for myself. All good things come to me now because I no longer seek them for myself. And I know I've been a pastor more than two decades. <laughs> I know that sometimes when I know sometimes people get nervous and a little bit fearful when we talk about commitments that extend and find their center beyond the self. Unfortunately, these, unfortunately, these are the same people who consistently miss out on the freedom that comes from to those who make their first commitment, God and others. And perhaps one, perhaps you're one of those people. How many times have you heard this text? And how many times have you heard Jesus say what he says? And yet you've just not really ever committed to it. Indeed, if, if, if that describes you, I want to encourage you this morning to stop listening to it from a distance, from the sidelines, things like what you've heard this morning. And commit yourself to such things and make those things your own because no life transformation ever takes place apart from making a sincere personal life commitment to them. Love God and love people. Let us pray. To make the decision, to make the commitment. We know what it's like to make commitments. Many of us are married. We stood before the priest and we made a commitment. We took vows. And as God gives us grace, we're keeping those vows. We, we pay our house note. Uh, if, we, if we're buying a car, we, we, pay, the, we, pay, we pay on that. Uh, we, we go to work and, and we, 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 uh, if we've signed covenants or, or contracts, we keep them. And yet, uh, I don't know, some of us, Lord, haven't taken these things seriously. We haven't maybe committed to these things, to love you with all our heart, mind and strength, our, our soul. And we haven't committed to loving our neighbors ourselves. Oftentimes we hold other people to a higher standard that we, than we even hold ourselves. And it's just a completely unhealthy circumstance. We receive your grace and your forgiveness and your love, and then we hold grudges and refuse to forgive others. We, refuse, we receive your grace but refuse to be gracious with them. And it leads, to, it leads to a sense of discontent, and often peace evades us as well as joy. And so then, since we're not enjoying your joy and your peace, then we go and try to find it in various different circumstances and buy this and go here and there. And we have to keep on doing that because the joy and the contentment and the pleasure that we derive from those things is short-lived. And so we just have to keep on pursuing all these different idols that can never satisfy us. Because as Pascal said, we all have a God-shaped hole within us and until you fill that hole, until we surrender to you and put you in that, in that hole, in the, in the center of us, we can never know true peace and joy and satisfaction. And so, Lord, I pray that we would take to heart the things uh, that we have considered this morning, the things that we've heard, and that they would not only just belong to a preacher or other people in the church that we would designate as being committed, 
uh, but that we would commit to them ourselves, that none of these things would any longer evade us, but they would be ours as a result of such commitment. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.